this morning, first of all, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to read verses 14 through 18. And I want to speak on the subject this morning of separated. Separated. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. It seems we don't hear as much these days about separated living as perhaps we once did. And when we do, I wonder how well we understand what that means. Now, I'm sure we all have a, at least a vague idea what it means, but are we really living a separated life? And one of the things I want us to notice this morning is that the idea of a separated living is not a new concept. It is not something that began with New Testament Christianity. But for as long as God has had a people for Himself, He has commanded them to be holy, for He is holy. <clears throat> now I was thinking about this, and some of the verses that we will read this morning, uh, it struck me how that God has dealt with us God has from the beginning chosen a people unto Himself to be His people. And He sent His Son to die for them and to redeem them through the giving of His life on the cross. And that by the preaching of the Gospel He calls us and by the wooing of the Holy Spirit He draws and quickens us. And the transaction is made. And we find ourselves the recipients and the beneficiaries of His grace and have become such as are responsible to obey and to do His will. As a child of God, redeemed, that is our relationship to Him. Sometimes people don't consider all the ramifications. They think, well, I'm not going to go to hell. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I have eternal life. But there's more to redemption than that. And we want to look at this. And we want to go to the book of Leviticus. Now, I want us, considering what we just read in 2 Corinthians, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, because He is our God and we're His people, He tells us, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Now, in Leviticus chapter 20, and beginning with verse 22 through 26, Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes, 
and all my judgments, and do them, that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. Ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, and between unclean fowls and clean. And ye shall not make your souls abominable by beasts, or by fowl, or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have severed you from other people, that you should be mine. He said, I have separated you from you as unclean. God has declared some things are unclean and some things are clean. And that's what Paul is referring to there in 2 Corinthians and touch not the unclean thing. He has separated those from us, but he's also, he says, I have severed you and have separated you from other people to be my people. Now, let's go back into the New Testament for a moment. Book of Titus. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works." Notice he says here, and so we see the same thing, that God is, by His grace has saved us, but He is separating us, and that he says that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. He has redeemed us from all iniquity and is purifying us unto Himself. That is, He has set us apart unto Himself. We are His peculiar possession in that sense. Peculiar not in the sense of being odd, but peculiar in being the particular possession of God. We belong to Him and Him only. Zealous of good works. Now, back in Leviticus, we want to go to chapter 18. And actually, I want to look at three verses of Scripture here. And as we, we look at these Scriptures, and, and keep in mind, in, in Titus that we read, God has uh, presented us with both a negative, those things we shall not, and a positive, those things we shall do. And, and together this combines, uh, this is what makes us a separated people. The things that He separated us from and the things He separated us unto. Uh, there are both aspects of this. And we want to look at this as we read the Scriptures. In Leviticus 18 verses 1 through 5, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. Now, notice, He is presenting this. He is our God. He has become our God. Now, 
He is our God from creation. And in that sense, He's, he's everybody's God because there's only one true God. There's only one Creator. And the time will come when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that He is Lord. Nobody can exempt themselves from His rule and say, well, that, that doesn't pertain to me because I don't believe in God. I don't believe in your God. That may suit for the present. But you see, in eternity, there's only going to be one God. And He's going to be the judge, and He's the one you're going to stand before and give an account to. And so in that sense, He is your God. But He's not your God in the sense that we're His people and He is our God. That is His redeemed people. And this is how he's presenting himself here to the children of Israel. And by extension, he's presenting himself as such to us. In the fact that the children of Israel are the descendants of Abraham and the recipients of the covenant and the promise that God made to Abraham. And Paul said that covenant, that promise was not made to his seed after the flesh only. But we are the seed of Abraham by faith. So we can take the principles presented here and see how they apply to us because we see in the New Testament how these things are quoted or the same thing stated to us as applicable to us in the New Testament. And so he says, speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, I am the Lord your God. So he said, here... I have a claim to you. I have a claim over you. You're my people. And I'm your God. And that's what Paul said. He said, uh, no, you're not. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And God lays claim to us. Now, in verse 3, he says, Now, after the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do, neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Now here, he kind of sets, you're kind of betwixt and between. You're coming out of one place, you're going into another. And said, and I don't want you doing after the customs of the Egyptians where I'm bringing you out of. But neither do I want you to adopt the practices of the Canaanites where you're going. And then he says, and what you shall do is what I command you to do. You're not going to do after the, the manners of men and, and so on. And I was thinking about that. You know, when the Lord saved us, and that's one of the verses we want to come to, our former life, that's kind of like Egypt how we lived and how we practiced and the things that we thought and did before the Lord saved us. He said, I don't want you to do that anymore. And the world, we're in the world, but not of the world. And the world that we're in now, and it's constantly changing. So we're not to adopt and adapt to those practices either. But you have one standard by which you're to live and that standard's never going to change. I am the Lord, I change not. And so the past is past, but we're not to continue in those ways and the future is ever changing. But the path that God has laid out for us doesn't change. He says, you shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances and walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Jeremiah 10.2 That's verse 9 and I've used it many times. 
But I want just to think about this basic and how it applies to what we've read here in Leviticus. And here's the thing. In Leviticus, God is telling them before they ever get into the land, as we take that history and what transpires and the children of Israel forgot the commandments of God, they went away from God, they began to adapt the, the ways of the world and God brought them under judgment and they were coming under judgment uh, in the days of Jeremiah he was the prophet at the time of the captivity when Judah was taken captive by uh, the Chaldeans and Israel had done the very things God had told them not to do here. And so what Jeremiah is saying here, he's reiterating. And he's also pointing out, he's preparing them, you're going to go into captivity into Chaldea, into Babylon. Don't pick up their ways. That's what got you into trouble to start with. And so in Jeremiah 10, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen. That's what I want us to think about. As, part of, as we look at these things, and we want to hit upon some specifics, in that these are the, the customs, the manners, uh, the habits of the heathen, of the unbelievers, which God has told us there in Corinthians, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And it's not just talking about marriage, but in, in, our, in all of our relations, in fellowship, in partnerships, and in other relationships, don't be yoked together with unbelievers because it's an unequal yoke. It goes back to the Old Testament principle, you don't plow, you don't yoke oxen and... Uh, uh, the asses together to plow with. It's an unequal yoke. They can't pull together. And that was to teach and all those, you know, like odd things that we think about. So, well, we're not under that law anymore. But the principle that they were there to remind the Israelite people, you're to be a separated people. When they went to the field to, to plow, they was reminded not to be unequally yoked together. When they sold their seed, they were not to sow diverse seed. They were not to intermarry with unbelievers. When they wore their clothing, they were not to mix the, the, the types of cloth. You know, there's one righteousness, and that's of God. We're to be a holy people, a separated people. And so in all those things, they were constantly reminded day in and day out to be a separated people. And so he says here, learn not the way of the heathen. In Ephesians chapter 2, and we made reference to this, as Paul describes us and what we came out of, that's why he's describing it. Ephesians chapter 2, You hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now he's describing that state that we were dead in trespasses and in sins. What does that mean? Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or manner of life in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's what it means to be dead in trespasses and in sin. And that's what the Lord brought us out of. That's our Egypt. And then when He says, now don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, that's our Canaan. That's where we're going. That's what He brought us out of, and that's where we're going. So as I said, we're presented here both with a negative, thou shalt not, as well as a positive, ye shall do. We're in the world, but not of the world. Separated and distinguished by what we do not do and by what we do. In both we show God's hands upon us and working in us. As Paul said there in Philippians 2, 
uh, 13, he says, God that worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. And so we are distinguished by and identifiable by both the things that we do not do, that we abstain from doing, as well as the things that we do. Together, these identify us as God's people. Now let's look at some specifics. You know, we talk a lot about generalities. And that's where we get kind of the vague idea of what it means to have a separated life. We know we're supposed to be a separated people. But sometimes we don't go any further than that. But the Scripture goes further. The scripture gets into certain specifics. And we see as we study it, there's nothing new under the sun. The world is full of heathen today. They may wear a three-piece suit cost $500 or more, have a Rolex watch on, but he's still a heathen if he's an unbeliever. His ways are not God's ways. You know, you, you don't have to be wearing a loincloth in some jungle somewhere to be a heathen. We need to realize that. And so, and, and you can write some of the things that he names here, you write them, they're all around us. You go into the grocery store and you'll see the evidences of heathenism. I mean, you go anywhere and you will see this. Unfortunately, you go into a lot of churches and you see the same signs of heathenism as you do in the world. And that's exactly what he's talking about here, uh, that we are to be a separated uh, people. In Leviticus chapter 18 and 19. Details. Many of the specific ways we are to be different. While chapter 20 outlines the punishment to be meted out for the violations of His commands. In chapter 20 mentions some of the same things He's mentioned in 18 and 19. But here He's giving the punishments due. How they was to put away from them those who committed such things. In Leviticus 18, we've already read the first five verses. Verses 6 through 23 involves what we say, sexual impurities. In particular, I believe what he's dealing with here, now God created and ordained the institution of marriage. He made man and He made female. He created man He made them male and female. He brought Adam and Eve and presented Eve to Adam as His wife. And He ordained the institution of marriage. And God as Creator is able to regulate who we marry. And to define what marriage is. We see that marriage is a union between one man and one woman for life. That was God's intent from the beginning. And the institution of marriage. The sexual relationship is to be confined to marriage. Anything else outside of marriage, he says, it is sin. And here we see some restrictions, though, even on who we are allowed to marry. And here, even though prior to this, marriage to close kin was not only permitted, it was a necessity. They said, where did Cain get his wife? from his mother-in-law. But obviously he married a sister. That was the only pool that was available, if you will. He took one of his sisters to wife and, and departed. Because there was only one original couple and they had, and Adam and Eve, they had sons and daughters. So the original mankind 
we see that Sarah was Abraham's half-sister. She didn't tell a complete lie, or Abraham didn't tell a complete lie when he said, she's my sister. But she was also his wife. We see Isaac married, I believe it was the first cousin, and so on. But when we come down to the time when Moses, when they came up out of Egypt, now God is restricting marriage and forbidding marriage to those close of kin. And he goes through here and elaborates on uh, some different things. You know, uh, and it, it, this can't just be saying, well, you ought not to have a, a to fornicate or to commit adultery. That's already covered under those two terms. But by being specific here and mentioning different next of kin, he talked about situations where you could marry, but because they're next of kin or close kin or close kin to someone who is close kin, then it's restricting marriage. And so we see these uh, verses here from verse 6 through verse 23 dealing with uh, sexual impurity, marriage to close kin, forbidden incest, adultery. We see in verse uh, 21 uh, offering our children to Moloch. Uh, he says, verse 21, Thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. And so he, he mentions here uh, in particular in verse 21 uh, about Moloch. And the, one of the things that comes to mind in, in modern day that would be the equivalent of that, I would say, would be abortion. They offered up their seed, their children here, uh, as a sacrifice to Moloch. And people today, for whatever reasons, they engage in relationships outside of marriage. They don't want to be pregnant. Uh, they abort, and this has become a major institutionalized business in this country. And I believe that abortion is sin. I do believe it is murder and considered as murder in the Old Testament uh, because we pointed out there how that they treated the unborn child the same as an adult under the law when it came to if a pregnant woman was struck and she lost the child. Uh, if the child died, then life would go for life. And so there's different things there. That, uh, but he goes on and, and in verses um, 22, he says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It's an abomination. I don't know how. You know, Satan's just an outright liar at times. Now, he, he will bend the truth, he'll pervert the truth, but sometimes he just outright lies. When he told Eve in the Garden of Eden, Thou shalt not surely die, that was just an outright lie. And some people today, they try to justify homosexuality and even in the churches and amongst believers and say the Bible doesn't say anything about, doesn't condemn homosexuality. You might be of an opinion that you don't agree with the Bible, but to say that the Bible does not condemn it is an outright lie. Right here it says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Romans 1.27, he, he describes it and defines it's vile affections. It is that which is against nature. It's unnatural. And yet people condone it. And it exists in our Baptist churches. Everyone, it crops up. 
many times in, in our children that are raised in our churches. Now, we, we know people have had friends, different ones, have had to deal with this. Now, some people trying to show themselves how holy they are are just really mean-spirited about it. Sin is sin. Fornication is sin. Adultery is sin. Homosexuality is sin. It's all sin. And God, love and mercy extends to sinners. And this is listed in, in one of the lists there in Paul's writing, and he says, and such were some of you. God saves homosexuals. God has compassion upon them. And He saves people that are homosexuals. He saves people who have been fornicators. He saves people who have been adulterers. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so, we need to keep that in mind as we look, but it ought not to be amongst those who claim to be saved. And I think one of the reasons we've gotten away from preaching on it and we've gotten away from preaching on being a separated people and what all that means. And this is one of the things that is listed here. As we said, as Paul refers to it in Romans as vile affections. Verse 23 even lists, uh, lists bestiality. Verse 24 it says, Defile not yourselves in any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. As we read, and as I said, it's all around us. There's nothing new under the sun. Moses, God is warning Moses and through him the children of Israel back in, in the days here when they come up out of Egypt of these very things. And they're still in the world today. And as God's people in the world, but not of the world, we have to deal with it. But these are some of the, he said, learn not the way of the heathen. And if we pay more attention, especially as young people know, to what God said, and, and, and let Him direct us when it comes to marriage, and we are obedient to His laws, and, and oh, when it comes to marriage, we would save ourselves a whole lot of heartache. He is your God, you're His people, and He has the right to tell you who you can marry and who you shouldn't marry. So, he goes on uh, through verse 30 as saying, you not to defile yourselves in any of these things. He said, for all these abominations have the men of the land done which were before you, and the land is defiled. Verse 30 says, therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you that you defile not yourselves therefore or therein. I am the Lord your God. <clears throat> Chapter 19. He begins much the same. Verses 1 and 2. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. It's not up for debate. It's not optional. <clears throat> I'm your God. You're my people. 
I'm holy, and you're going to be a holy people. And here we get some of the thou shalt. The very first thing <coughs> he mentions here, the, the positive command. Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father and keep my Sabbaths. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, Honor your father and your mother. And I notice here, and it's not to be dismissed lightly. He mentions the mother first. A lot of this is written, it seems like, from the standpoint of speaking to the men. And you men, you young men, you boys, you know, the scripture gets twisted sometimes. Women are not to be under subjection to men. The Bible doesn't teach that. The wife is to be in submission to her husband only. Now, she's in submission to her father until she marries, and then she's under the authority of her husband. Notice the scripture is very specific in that. But sometimes we see it presented in a way that men are superior to women and that men are to rule over women. And the Bible doesn't teach that. And so, he, and to underline that, I believe, when he's given this order, he puts the mother first. And children are to be obedient to their parents, both of them, not just the father. And it sets the mother first here. Read the book of Proverbs when it's talking there and, and Solomon's talking to his son and he talks about the law of your mother. To fear or to reverence. In the same sense that we're to fear God. You're to fear or reverence your mother and your father and to keep God's sets. Well, we don't have time to go into the New Testament uh, teaching uh, about the Lord's Day being the Sabbath of, of the Christians and replacing the Old Testament Sabbath. But I do believe Hebrews said there's still a Sabbath keeping for the people of God. One day in seven is set apart. And by this, we sanctify ourselves and set ourselves apart from the world. The world treats the Lord's Day like any other day. They'll work on Sunday. They'll play ball on Sunday. They'll do all these things on Sunday just like any other day. God's people are to hallow the Sabbath. They're to set it apart and reserve it to the Lord's use. We're His people. He is our God. And that's one of the ways that we show that. Verse 4 he says, don't be turned to uh, idols. Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. And that's one of the things in Jeremiah 10 he gets into. He talks about the idol, the doctrine of the stock, or of the idols. It's vanity. It's foolish. They can't do anything. How can something that you made with your own hands... Therefore, you're greater and mightier than that piece of wood or that piece of metal. How's it going to help you when you can't help yourself? That's kind of foolish, isn't it? The doctrine of the stock is a vain doctrine, he says. And he goes on to point, it's because God is the creator. He's created all things. And He is the Lord over all things. He is the only one to be worshipped that is worthy to be worshipped because He is the Creator. So why don't worship idols? Evolution is the doctrine of the atheist and the humanist which makes man a god. And that's the ultimate idolatry. 
When man says, I am the captain of my own destiny, he is placing himself equal to God, he's making himself a God, and he's committing idolatry. Don't be deceived and taken in by the teachings of the humanism and atheism and evolution that Paul says in Timothy, science falsely so called. Uh, there, there are so many things here and, and, and time is running short and I just want to hit on a few. I, I like verse 14. Chapter 19, verse 14. Thou shalt not curse the deaf nor put a stumbling block before the blind. I, I can just see. Somebody's deaf, they can't hear you. You can say anything you want to about them. They can't hear you. You think that's funny. Here's somebody that's blind. You put something in front of them so they'll trip over it and then laugh. Isn't that funny? Don't be a bully. Don't take advantage of other people. Don't pick on people just because you can. That's being a bully. Don't be mean. We're to be kind-hearted, tender-hearted. We're to show kindness. Yeah. Don't learn the way of the heathen. Because that's what the heathen did. They think that's funny. Make fun of somebody that can't hear you. Or just do something to somebody because they can't do anything about it. Don't be a boy. Verse 16. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Don't be a gossip. Don't be a talebearer. Don't be a busybody. And Paul talks about in the New Testament about those that are busybodies, meddling in other people's matters. Don't be a sower of discord. All these things are prevalent today and in society. And it's the way of the heathen. It's not the way of God's people. Don't learn the way of the heathen. So these are the things that the lost people in the world do, and that's why God's going to cast them out. Now one of these days, we're going to be in possession of this land. And we're going to rule and reign over it. Right now, we're kind of in betwixt and between. But because of this wickedness that's in the world, God's going to cast them out. Or He's going to give us rule over them. So don't learn their ways. Verses 23 through 25 talks about respect for the land. Verse 26 says, Neither shall you use enchantment or observe times. Verse 31 says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards, to be defiled by them. I'm the Lord your God. No. Don't check your horoscope. Don't call the psychic hotline. Yeah. You can drive up and down some of these streets and you'll see these signs out there, you know, palm reader. That's the way of the heathen. Boy, we have come a long way, haven't we? Society has evolved to such a state today. We've come such a long way. <laughs> Not really. We have the same ignorance, superstition, idolatry, and heathenism just around the corner as what Moses was telling the people to avoid in his day. Uh, he, he gets into some grooming about the beard and the hair. Uh, and I'll just say this, 
but the Bible teaches men are to have short hair, women are to have long hair. I, I personally believe, you know, men, beard was a sign of distinction because men will grow facial hair naturally. That's the genetics. That's one of the differences God made between men and women. Uh, but if you have a beard, I think, because when we talk about rounding the corner of the beards, I was wondering about that. I think that's where they shave this part off. They just have this. I've done that before. I thought that was cool looking. But if you want to have a beard, have a full beard. Uh, verse 28. Thou shalt not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Actually, some of the translations uh, said no tattoos. It actually uses the word tattoos. That's what it's talking about. You know, two of the things that are so popular today, and I bet you can go into most sound Baptist churches and find church members that are guilty of these things. Piercings and tattoos. The way of the heathen. And he says to avoid. Uh, verse 30, remember, again, keep the Sabbath and reverence God's sanctuary. <coughs> verse 32, here's another good one. It's kind of lost. It has to do with just good manners. You know, God's people, we ought to be the ex set the example of good manners. And so verse 32, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. And show respect to your elders. And it was considered good manners. You know, when, and it's considered good manners if a woman enters the room. You're sitting down, you're in the room, you're talking, and a woman enters that you stand up. That's respect. The same was true for the elderly, the aged, the, the gray hair. They enter the room, you stand up. You know, in the courtroom, the judge enters the room, everybody stands. Why? It's a sign of respect. Respect for elders, respect for those. And it talks about defrauding. Defrauding is holding back that which is due. Be polite, respectful to those to whom respect is due, whether it be because of their age, because of their position. Verses 33 through 34 talks about there's just one law. It's the same for the Israelites as it is for the stranger that dwells among them. We don't treat Christians one way and unbelievers another. We're to love our enemies, we're to love our neighbors. We're to do good. We're to show kindness. And so those teachings here about manners, showing respect, uh, and all these things, we are to apply those to the unbelievers as well. Verses 35 through 36 talks about just and fair business dealings. Dealing honestly. In all your, your business, they'll talk about a just weight and these things. Because this is how they measured, this is how they bought and sold, and, and, and make sure, you know, when you sold a bushel, it was a bushel. If you, you know, you didn't have a, a slightly smaller basket and call it a bushel. You know, charge the price of a bushel, but give them less than a bushel. You know, uh, the weights and, and all these things. Just be honest, fair, just in your dealings. Verse 37, he says, Therefore shall ye observe all my statutes and all my judgments and do them. I am the Lord. Comes back to that. He's the Lord. 
He's the one in charge. He said, you will do. It's kind of like a father telling the son, so you will do what I tell you to do. Now the son may rebel, but there will be consequences. And most of the time, they'll result in the son coming back and doing what he was told to do eventually. And that's the way it is with the Lord. We're His people. He's the Lord. He's in charge. We will do what He tells us to do. Now, He may have to chastise us. We get stubborn, rebellious. There will be consequences if we disobey. And notice, He says, He will observe and do them. Matthew 28, 20. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This is part of what He's commanded us. It's not just limited to the text in red. When someone meets you on the street, in the store, etc., they should be able to see a difference between you and the world. Not just an outward appearance, but it encompasses now the outward appearance, the difference in our grooming, in our hair, in our how we dress, modest apparel, and all these things. But our countenance, our speech, our behavior, and demeanor. Don't copy the world's fashions, fads, or behavior. We need to learn to discern between that which is clean and that which is unclean, between that which is holy and that which is profane or common. That which God has set apart and called holy, we are to maintain that difference and that distinction. In our original text, 2 Corinthians, Verse 17 and 18, let us read this again. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now these things we've touched upon, it's not a complete list, but it does touch on many of the areas of our lives that are to be brought under the control of God's will. As we said, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he says that we've been bought with a price. He says, what know ye not that your body, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. And you're not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. So that means what you do with your body, what you put on your body, God has authority to tell you. Don't put marks on your body. You know, wear modest apparel. Those things that He's commanded. He has the right it belongs to Him. And your spirit, your attitude, that belongs to God too. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. Separate. We are to be a separated people. Separated and distinguishable both by the things that we refrain and abstain from doing at the same time of the things that we embrace and that we do and we hold to the things that we believe the things we practice these are the things that distinguish us as a child of God our love by this shall all men know you're my disciples and that you have love one toward another as part of being separated, different from the world. 
Let us stand together. I hope the Lord uses this and, and, and can teach us some things and, and help us to recognize areas in our lives that we can do better and that, to realize we're not to be like the world. We're not to copy the world. Uh, we're not to desire the things of the world and, and to be friendship with the world. The, the friendship of the world is enmity with God. And so we need to remember those things. Learn not the way of the heathen. We're to be a separated people. Come out from among them, be you separate. Touch not the unclean thing. Now I will receive you. I tell you what, also, if you're not saved, he said, you come unto me. All you that labor heavy, like, you come unto me, and I will receive you, and I will no wise cast you out. He'll receive you also if you come to him for salvation, forgiveness of sin. Understand, you do. He's redeeming you. You belong to him, and he has authority over you. But that authority is always for our good and to benefit us and to bless us and prevent us from many of the problems that you see the world having as well. Yeah, they have all this stuff, but look at all the problems they have too. God doesn't want you to have those problems. Let us stand.